Coming up on Harvard Chan This Week in Health, part four of our series on climate change. When the place you call home is burned down, blown away, dried up, flooded, see injuries, illness, and death, the mix of fear, anger, sorrow, and trauma can easily send the person to the breaking point. In this week's episode, how changes to the environment will have wide-ranging effects on mental health and why it's critical to take action now. Hello and welcome to Harvard Chan This Week in Health. It's Thursday, March 9th, 2017. I'm Noah Levitt. And I'm Amy Montemiro. This is part four of our series examining the links between climate change and health. In previous episodes, we've talked about how climate change is likely to force people from their homes, affect our food supply, and cause a spike in some infectious diseases. This week, though, we're taking a closer look at something that's not often discussed when talking about climate change, mental health. In a few minutes, we'll be playing you another clip from the recent climate and health meeting in Atlanta. Last week, you heard it from Sam Myers about the effects of climate change on our food supply. And he outlined how environmental changes will affect what we can grow, where we can grow it, and in the end, make our food less nutritious. If you missed that episode or any of our other climate change podcasts, you can visit hsph.me slash climate podcast to listen. This week we'll be sharing a presentation from Lisa Van Susteren, a psychiatrist and an advisory board member for the Center for Health and the Global Environment. Over the next seven minutes, she'll explain that climate change is likely to be a root cause of mental health issues, but can also act as a threat multiplier. It will make existing mental health problems worse. Take a listen. Everything related to climate change, either directly or indirectly, all the losses, injuries, illnesses, displacements, carry with them an attendant emotional toll that must be included as we tally up the psychological impacts of climate change. So I'll start with a few of the mental impacts for which we have precise data and then move on to those for which we do not. We know of the link between extreme climate and weather events to aggression. For each standard deviation of increased temperature and rainfall, we can expect a 4% increase in conflict between individuals and a 14% increase in conflict between groups. The findings are valid for all ethnicities and regions, so more assaults, murders, and suicides, an increase in unrest all over the world should come as no surprise. Air pollution forming more readily at higher temperatures with particulate matter crossing into the brain via the olfactory nerve, causing neuroinflammation linked to multiple mental and neurologic problems. Cognitive decline in all age groups, including Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative disorders such as Parkinson's disease and ALS. It is linked to autism and to psychiatric disorders. The American Psychological Association reports that children exposed in utero to air pollutants were more likely to have symptoms of anxiety or depression. Emergency room visits for panic attacks and threats to commit suicide are higher on days with poor air quality. Exposing workers to increasing levels of CO2 has significant impact on their cognitive functioning. The testing at indoor concentrations to which Americans are frequently exposed shows the most serious decline in our ability to think strategically, to use information, and to respond to a crisis. Not good. But not everything that counts can be counted. Indeed, it is the inchoate, insidious, complex, and unconscious psychological states driven by climate trauma not lending themselves to studies and precise numbers that are the most profoundly damaging and drive systemic emotional conditions society will find difficult to treat and surmount. We must think about it, the balance between the need for data with the need to connect emotionally, because emotional connection is at the heart of what moves people to action. And action now turns on our success, in part at least, in stirring empathy. When the place you call home is burned down, blown away, dried up, flooded, when you lose your possessions, maybe your pets, your your livelihood, your community, see injuries, illness, and death, the mix of fear, anger, sorrow, and trauma can easily send the person to the breaking point. Mental health professionals are seeing a full range of psychiatric disorders, PTSD, major depression, generalized anxiety, a rise in the abuse of drugs and alcohol, domestic violence, most often against women, and a rise in child abuse. Some of us are lucky enough to be at a distance from the world's climate disasters, but we're not potted plants sitting here. 
This is empathic identification with the victims. It is painful seeing people drowned, burned, flooded, starved, right? Special populations that are at risk, children, the elderly, the sick, the disabled, the mentally ill, of course, the poor, those living in the bullseye of disaster-prone areas along coastlines and rivers, tornado alleys, inner cities with the heat island effect, first responders, climate Cassandras who suffer from pre-traumatic stress disorder in the grip of images of future disasters they can't put out of their minds. In the first published climate change delusion, a 17-year-old Australian boy had to be hospitalized for refusing to drink water, believing it would cause millions to, in his drought-ridden country to die of thirst. The Melbourne Children's Hospital doctor who treated him told me he has a clinic full of children with climate anxieties. Though the result of multiple forces, climate change is both a threat multiplier and a root cause of the mental health crises from the explosion of refugees today searching for safety, destabilization of regions with groups dangerous to world security rising in these feral conditions. In Europe, a sharp turn to the far right politically, the once open question about America, was answered in November. In times of peril and scarcity, people regress. They turn to what they perceive as strong leaders to protect them and are willing to give up their freedoms and values in exchange for perceived security. And fears often flip to a more empowering form, anger, explaining why hearing about scary climate change can evoke so much aggression. The experiences of citizens stranded at the Superdorm in New Orleans in the days after Katrina are an example of how quickly our systems can be overwhelmed and our faith in them turned upside down. Faith in a functional government is the sine qua non of a stable society. And when disasters are no longer experienced solely as acts of God or nature, but to derive from the behavior of humans, it will be much tougher on us because what happens from intentional negligence is harder to put behind us than what happens accidentally. Carried by an on-off switch, the activation of a human gene for stress in the face of trauma can be passed on to succeeding generations, compounding the toll. A new term has been coined, solastalgia, to describe the pain of seeing lands that once gave the treasured sense of home now lost or irreparably damaged. Should I have a baby is a question increasingly being asked by young people worried about the carbon costs of bringing another person into the world. A doctoral student in anthropology at Stanford and one of his friends whom I'm in contact with have been discussing rational suicide in the face of climate and carbon impacts. As we register the warning that by mid-century 30 to 50 percent of species may be on the path to extinction, and considering the life-sustaining biodiversity, the overwhelming beauty and complexity of nature, inspiring us with awe and wonder, what our friend Eric Shibian would likely ask is the cost not only to human health, but the cost to our souls. When we put people in harm's way, there's a name for it. It's called aggression. To our children, though they are not yet calling it this, it's clearer every day that destructive inaction on climate, and this is my professional opinion, will be experienced as child abuse, with all the attendant mental health impacts we would expect. That was Lisa Van Susteren on the effects of climate change and mental health. As we mentioned at the beginning, if you missed any of our past episodes on climate change and health, you can visit hsph.me slash climate podcast to catch up on what you missed. In next week's episode, we'll be taking a closer look at the growing use of nanotechnology in foods. We'll be discussing the benefit of nanoparticles, as well as some of the potential risks that scientists are now exploring. That's all for this week's episode. I'm Noah Levitt. And I'm Amy Montemiro. A reminder that you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, or listen anytime at soundcloud.com slash harvardpublichealth.